things that we had been taught are, are myths, things that are just only made for movies or comic books or magazines, Fangoria, or this thing stood up on two legs. His officers had gotten calls about these things. He had two officers that had seen it and that he knows all about it. And he gave him the implication that it at least had killed one of those two people. I, mean, I am sweating, I'm sorry. Um, grabbed him, I said, listen to me. I said, you are gonna come with us or we're gonna leave you here to die. Oh, um, dude, your story is, woo! It, it's, 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 it's affecting it, it's me, man. I'm like, haunted. I'm all choked up. This interview is easily the most frightening one that I've ever done. And this episode, this interview is with a man named Matt Emsch. And this is a guy I met at the conference about six or so weeks back at the Paranormal Roundtable conference. Now, I had a chance to actually spend several days with the guy, hang out with him. Just a really great dude. Um, I'm happy to get to call him a friend now. Real down earth, really, really nice, sweet guy. However, the account that he's going to share with us today is completely and utterly terrifying. In fact, it's easily one of the most terrifying I've ever heard. Now, if you guys want to understand something about this interview that I'm about to show you, is the emotions that I experienced during the actual recording were completely genuine. And in fact, this is the only experience that I've ever choked up at several times throughout. Anyway, I'll let Matt take it from here. So my name is Matt Amsch. Um, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, when uh, I was about 14 years old, uh, me and three of my friends had this experience uh, in the old steel mills down in uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, if you go to Google uh, old steel mills of Youngstown, Ohio, um, you will see specifically if you bring up the blast furnace and you put blast furnace old steel mills, Youngstown, Ohio, it'll literally bring up a picture of the blast furnace area where this experience happened. And, um, you know, I grew up in Youngstown. Uh, I, I live uh, in a suburb of Youngstown now, so still in the area. Uh, my friends and I would just basically go everywhere, you know, and anywhere uh, on our bikes or walking. And one of the things that we like to do is we like to frequent uh, the steel mills because one of my best friends who was there the day of this experience um, literally lived right across the street from the entrance to these steel mills. So on uh, Route 422 or Youngstown Warren Road in Youngstown, if you look that up, you'll see it's right across from the steel mill. So his house uh, overlooked Youngstown Warren Road or Route 422. You would basically cross the street across from his house, jump over a fence, run across the highway, which was 422, and then we would enter into this area of the old steel mills. And we had to go down uh, a number of different areas to get down there. It took us about a half an hour to get to the blast furnace area where we basically liked to hang out the most. Uh, you know, we checked out the whole area, but we kind of made the this one building in the blast furnace area our quote unquote like home base. And this was a four floor building uh, that would, uh, if you walk to the inside of it, you could look up and you could see if you were in the middle of the room, each floor. So if you were up on, say, the third floor, you could walk into the middle of the room. There would be a half concrete wall and you could look down to the bottom floors or you could look up to the fourth floor. And it was just an old, rundown, dilapidated building and it had, uh, open walls on the first floor. And this is important to the situation. Um, what it had is, is on the north, uh, south, east and west walls, it was open. So we found inside of this place, um, these, these steel, um, basically the easiest way I could describe it is if, if you look at old, um, you know, uh, gladiatorial games where they had the shields that kind of wrapped around the shoulders to protect them. That's how these things were shaped. They had hundreds of them in there. So what we did is we took them and we, we lined them up next to each other and we made makeshift walls out of this, this metal, uh, whatever they were. And we made two rows that's as high as we could make it. Um, and we did that number one, because 
you know, it was the the time, uh, uh, you know, the the late eighties uh, in Youngstown, Ohio, was a very dangerous time. Uh, we we had some monikers for Youngstown that that they've gotten over the years that aren't real, you know, something to be proud of. Uh, you know, per capita, uh, the it was basically considered the highest murder rate of any city in in America at that time, and a lot of gang violence, um, a lot of mafia things still going on, especially in Youngstown. And you know, we didn't want to be down there when something was going on and people to see us. Uh, we didn't also want the people that worked in the steel mill that still to this day works. But, you know, there were a lot of different reasons in, in Youngstown to be careful down there. You know, we would go down there a lot of times armed. Uh, you know, we would have, you know, guns. We were 14 years old, but we did do it because, you know, you could run into homeless people. You could run into um, mafiosa that really were down there at that time. You could run into gangs that were doing whatever down there, hiding things or getting rid of bodies, which they found down in those areas over the years. But the thing that really made us most nervous were packs of wild dogs. And, you know, wild dogs in cities that uh, have areas that are not frequented by people anymore, you get, you know, packs, maybe uh, uh, six to 10 dogs in them, and they are not your you know, hey, Fido, come here, let me pet you. They will attack, they will kill. And and I believe, you know, in this two year period that this happened, uh, when, when uh, I was 14 and my friends and I went down there and had this experience, uh, there were two homeless people that were, were mauled. Um, those will come into play as well with this experience. Um, you know, it was unfortunately, called uh, Murder Town USA during this time, uh, per capita, um, Youngstown, Ohio, during different times, um, has had high rates of murder. And, you know, that's not something you want for, for your city or that. But unfortunately, that's how it was when I was growing up and my friends were. So we were just very cautious about what we did. We never shot anything or animals or anything. We just would bring guns down there because, you know, we just wanted to protect ourselves. And, you know, the guns were pretty sorry anyway. We would have my one buddy had an old 25 that the, the pin would pop out of it every time it shot. Another guy had a little 22 and I would gank my dad's 38 out of his closet. You know, he had an old cowboy boot in the back of his closet and he thought he was being slick. Well, dad didn't wear cowboy boots. So what's that doing in there? There's just one of them. So there was a 38 in there and, and you know, we would take it and, and just have it there for protection. And, you know, the, the time that this happened was we had just gotten out of eighth grade. Um, it was the summertime, so it was really nice and warm. And you know how it is being a boy, Josh. Um, you know, you get let loose from school and you just go buck wild and you and your friends just want to have fun. And we would go down there, you know, we would break things and we would just investigate everywhere. And, you know, if our families knew at that time, because they did find out if they knew at that time we were going down there, they would not have been happy. It was a very dangerous place. You know, you have an old dilapidated steel mill that was utilized, you know, during the, the strong period of the United States steel industry. And now this was rusted buildings and, and, you know, rebar hanging out where concrete used to be. And, you know, we would be in this one building I was talking about earlier that we frequented as our home base. And once in a while, a big chunk of concrete fall from the top of, you know, floor, which four floors, that's a, you know, that's a hefty drop. So we had to be careful and, you know, going up the stairs, say from the first floor to the second floor, there was an area um, where maybe four stairs were missing and we kind of had to hop over it and there was just rebar hanging out and that'll come into play as well. And, um, you know, this was a, a big building, like I said, four floors, it had giant uh, concrete pillars in each corner of the room, which also will come into play with with description of what was going on when when it happened. And um, these things went obviously from underground to the very top of the building, and and they were probably I'd say I don't know four to five feet wide and as tall as the building was. So we would have giant fires in the center of this room. Uh, you know there was no 
no you know shortage of materials that we could find to burn there was always pallets and things like that and the night that we had the experience we had a giant fire going um and we were inside and you know it's funny you know i've hear, heard a lot of experience with cryptids over time and you hear people kind of in mindsets when things happen and i recall before we heard what we heard um we were all kind of just staring at, at uh, uh, the fire and, and no one was talking and, you know, just kind of, you know, how do you get when you stare at fires? Everyone just kind of stares at it and you kind of drift away. And we heard this pack of wild dogs. So what we outside, you'd walk out and there was a concrete kind of, I don't know, just outcropping that the stairs had fallen away. And that was another reason why we liked this building because, um, nothing could run up these stairs. So we had to hop up and roll in to get into this building. So again, no, no dogs could get up there. And we liked that. And we heard them and we just kind of were like, okay, let's go outside and see what's going on. We're standing out on this outcropping and we're watching and a pack of six or seven dogs run by and they paid no attention to us at all. And right across from this building was a, um, a railroad track. And if you, again, Google Blast Furnace Old Steel Mills Youngson, Ohio, you'll see the picture of exactly what I'm talking about. The railroad tracks right in front of the buildings. And then just beyond them, there would be giant piles of coke, which is basically an ingredient in the steel making process. Uh, it's just a, something that they utilize to make it. And they had huge piles of these things. Um, I, I don't even know how high, I would say at least 15, 20 feet high, mile each way. So as far as the eye could see, it was just piles of this material. And um, these dogs ran right in front of our building and made a quick left. They ran across the railroad tracks. They went up the one side of the, of the pile of coke and then down the other side. And immediately uh, we start hearing fighting we assumed that the dogs were fighting with each other um we had no idea what was going on because they were on the other side it was dark we couldn't see all we could hear is dogs attacking um after maybe two or three seconds we started to realize no they're they're not fighting with each other they're fighting with something else because what came over the top of these dogs biting and and barking was a very loud and deep growl um, roar that basically let out, which every every one of us, you know, our eyes open, we're like, oh my God, there's something over there. They're attacking something else. And within a few seconds, we start hearing yelping. These dogs are yelping in pain. Um, and then what happened next was when all of the craziness started. And what happened was two dogs, one after another, come literally flying over the top of this pile of material, they were thrown like somebody had grabbed them and thrown them with great force. One, the first one I'll always remember, it was upside down and its butt and tail were facing us. So it definitely didn't jump, it was thrown and it hit the ground and rolled and it got up and limped away. Another one came and it, it hit the top of this and, and material went everywhere and it hit the ground. And I always remember this because, you know, I'm a dog lover. I'm an animal lover. It had a huge gash from its shoulder all the way to its, its midsection. It looked like something had, had flayed open the dog. And it was still alive. It was bleeding all over. It got up and it ran away. And, you know, I always remember, I was like, oh, my God, you know, I hope that dog lives. I, I don't think it did. It was very, very brutal the way that it looked. And then a couple more come thrown over it. And, and then the rest of the pack came running and they all went back the way they came, which was to our left in the way that we would come into this area. And we're watching them run away. There's blood on the ground. We're hearing them yelp as they run away. And as we're watching in just complete disbelief, one of my friends, I remember him like touching me on my back. He was he was to my left and behind me. And he goes, guys, what it, what is that? What is that over there? And we all simultaneously look to our right. And what ended up 
crawling up to the top of the pile of this material was quite honestly something that that you know and i say this all the time and i'll always say it um it, it was so big that it looked fake it, it was the biggest animal i have ever seen to date my friends agreed um you know there were four of us again so we were all able to talk about this for years after this experience two of them are gone unfortunately they passed away one is left and you know we always talk about this with each other or we did and my buddy that's still here we still to this day um talk about it and um it was basically just a, a gigantic wolf looking creature that was on all fours um you know we started comparing over time what we could say the size of this thing looked like and the easiest thing that we found once we started looking at pictures of things and because you know this was in the late 80s we didn't have the internet and all that so we're looking at, at magazines and books and and the, the shape and the size of this thing was the closest to a polar bear but it was as big as any polar bear or bigger and it had the 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 telltale shape of a polar bear where if you have a, a say like a kodiak grizzly bear it's like a walking boulder you know just giant and massive and just boom boom this was very sleek um long limbed um very lengthy you know more more muscular instead of just you know just big and bulky and long and it crawled to the top of this pile and it was watching where the dogs had gone and it hadn't paid any attention to us it hadn't noticed us at that point and what it did next you know i've always said this you know some people might find this amusing it was not amusing at all um because of what happened so this dog was watching them it was looking in the direction they left and it lifted its leg and it did its business and immediately we knew it was a, a male because of what it did and what was scary about it was the force at which you know when it started urinating it, at which it hit this pile of this material it was standing on pieces just started going up in the air you could hear the the stream it was like a hose had just been turned on and i i stepped back i was like whoa you know that that's not normal you know it, it's just so massive and it, it it was so strong of the stream that this thing let go i started feeling real fear because you know any second it's going to notice us and just as i'm thinking about that my buddy who had been to the back and noticed it first started to stumble backwards and fell into that metal makeshift wall that i had been describing to you and you know I mean, you know what's what happened it made oh that telltale God. sign of metal on concrete and rah, and immediately this thing snaps its head and it looks at us and we all froze because immediately the first thing that that jumped out to all of us was not eye shine it was a as bright as there was a power source coming from inside of this creature there was a yellow amber kind of orange bright light that was coming from its eyes and that's where we all were drawn that's where i was drawn immediately and and it was so big that you could see the anatomy of the eyes so you could see the pupil you could see you know each distinct circular you know circular uh shape of the eye if you look you know if we're just being general about the shape of the eye you have, you have multiple circles in your eyes you could see each one of them from we are probably about 20 25 feet from this animal so close but far enough to where we realized the size of it was was just so abnormal and so scary that you know we were just froze and it started looking at each one of us and you could tell which one of us it looked at because its eyes again were just so big and they were just lit up like like christmas trees and it looked at each one of us each one of us it looked down the line there were four of us and when it looked at me it felt like it was going through me and what happened next was this thing did something so alien and so insane that it it, it finally took us to 
things that we have been taught are, are myths, things that are just only made for movies or comic books or magazines, Fangoria, or this thing stood up on two legs. And it was already so massive. Again, it looked fake. It, it was just like, this can't be real. I'm sleeping. I, I'm going to wake up any time. I have to wake up, but we were awake and it stood up and it was twice as big as it was. And it was just so crazy. And, and we had entered into now everything we've been taught about creatures and, and, and werewolves and, and anything like that are fake. Now we're looking at a real one in front of us. And again, the thoughts going through my head and I asked my friends later, like, did you guys feel like, you know, we were sleeping, like you were dreaming? And they said similar things like, you know, yeah, like I, I felt like I was going to wake up at any moment, but then we just didn't. And and I kept having this sense of, okay, this is, this is a dream, you know, this can't be real. And it stood up and it was twice as big as it was, you know, height wise. Um, it had the, the, the dog shaped legs. Um, I remember immediately the thing that stood out to me immediately was, you know, it, it had a, a, a man's shape to it, but you always hear people say, oh, well, it was man shaped. Well, you can't compare what we saw to a man. It, 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 there's no man that was built like this. Its arms were so long, that's the first thing I noticed that they went past its knees almost to its ankles. It had hands that looked very similar, and, and I got a good look at them a little bit later, and I'll touch on it, but it had hands that looked like a raccoon, like, like the hands of a raccoon, just giant, huge hands, and um, massive, just build, muscles everywhere. Um, it did not have long, scraggly hair. I would say the hair was probably an inch long at most. It was actually very almost like it was groomed it, it was very tight um you could see every muscle it was as black as as any black i've ever seen it was almost like so black that it was darker than than the night blackness behind it it just wow. stood out it was so dark and all you could see are these eyes shining and um, it, it had, uh, you know, huge lats, huge biceps. I remember specifically when I noticed the legs, the quads on it, you could see, you know, any, any bodybuilder's quads, you know, you see the separation of the muscles and everything. You could see that, you could see, but it was so much bigger than any human being you have ever seen. And it, then what it did was it growled, but it was almost like a growl and a roar at the same time. And the way it came out is I've seen things over the years, um, you know, we've heard about infrasound, about how tigers and lions and, you know, they will use infrasound to to stun prey. They'll, it can actually jiggle the insides and the organs. And that's what I felt. And that's what my buddies felt. It, I've seen recordings of actually crocodiles and, and um alligators when they do their their kind of growl in the water and water bounces off of it was similar to that but but animal like like wolf like uh tiger like something of a co combination of that and it went through us all i remember when it hit me um i felt it go through my chest and the first thing I felt is I felt like I was going to go down on my knees, my my legs from the hips all the way down to my ankles, my calves, everything felt so weak that I that, you know, when you have dreams, when you're being chased by something and you can't run, that's what it felt like. But I couldn't move. I thought I was going to go down on both my knees. I was kind of bent over, but I was still looking at it. My other friend that was to my immediate right later told me that was what he felt similarly. Two of our other friends actually were completely bent over. One was dry heaving, said he felt like he was gonna pass out. The other said he felt like he was gonna throw up. Something's wrong, what's going on? And it takes a couple steps towards us. And I think the steps of it you know, moving towards us and how far it moved after it took two steps towards us 
snapped everybody back into reality. And I remember my buddy right over my left shoulder who had noticed it first, he turned and ran into the building and we followed suit, not quickly, as fast as we could. Um, and we just headed up the stairs. We ran to the third floor. I don't know why we went to the third floor. We just did. Um, there was really no way out of there. And I need to explain that too. So going up to the fourth floor, you would be stuck on the fourth floor. You could go out to the, to the roof area. There was a short uh, set of stairs that would take you to the roof. On the outside from the third floor was the fire escape. The fire escape, fire escape only went from the third floor up to the roof because the second floor on down had broken away and fallen down and was laying in a heap on the ground, all of the stairs were all twisted up in metal and everything. And so we really had nowhere to go. We were standing on the third floor and my one friend who had noticed at first was, um, was going basically postal. He starts losing it, he starts crying and screaming. And I remember, you know, I'll always remember this. I, you know, I was always a big kid and, and I grabbed them out of fear and I'm starting to sweat right now because I'm thinking about this and you know, it always brings me back. Um, he, I grabbed him and I put my hand around his mouth and I grabbed him so hard that I, I lifted him up the floor. His feet were, were hanging and he still, you know, muffled screams and, and we all are screaming at him. You, you got to shut up. It's going to come in here. It's going to hear you. You have to be quiet. You know, I was using choice words, of course. Finally, he started, you know, gasping for air and I put him down and, you know, I, I looked at him and we're like, we'll let you go. Are you going to be quiet? He, he let him go. And just as we let him go, he takes a deep breath. You hear a thump, the, the building vibrates, and then you hear the, the telltale sign of basically nails on concrete. And we all knew what that meant. I knew immediately it was coming in the building. So we're standing, this half wall is in front of us. We're looking down and all of a sudden, you know, we have this huge fire. It starts to come in and you got that kind of train effect of when is the train going to end? That's a long train. Well, yeah. this thing's coming in and it goes past this makeshift wall that we had created. And the first thing we noticed first was the shadow that hit the wall. Now, anybody walking by a fire, even if you're small, you're going to get a big shadow that gets thrown. So imagine something so big that it looks fake. And that's what we're looking at. It's shadow. So the shadow just overtook the entire wall. There really was no shape or form on the way. It was just black. And then we see the, the, head come in then the shoulders and the rest of it and the tail and as it's walking in you could see you know that that like when tigers or big cats walk you get the scapulas that pop up you know on the back and you're seeing the bones lifting but they were surrounded by so much muscle that you could see it rippling as it walked and it's looking around and it's sniffing the air it's obviously looking for us and we're all trying to be as quiet as we can just frozen in place and you know when it got near the fire you could start to see that it had saliva just pouring out of its mouth i'm not talking just dripping i'm talking like the sound of like when you're in an empty building or something and it's raining and you're hearing big drops hitting the saliva is hitting the concrete as it's walking and and that's a sign that you know said to me immediately you know, it, it's it's either going to feed or kill, and that's why it's salivating. And it bears its teeth every once in a while, and you get the glint of this white, and you see the, the teeth, when, even when its mouth was closed, the top uh, canines were hanging out, and you would get little glints of the bottom ones here that would show. So its teeth definitely hung out of its mouth, even when it wasn't bearing the teeth. And it walked by the fire and you could see immediately jet black, except for, I thought that it was a, maybe a, a reflection of the fire, but we all agreed later that it had a very light white stripe that went from the back of its neck all the way down to the tail.
And that was the only other color that this thing showed other than the eyes. Um, you know, you always hear stories about people that see um, dog men in, in the woods during the day and they talk about the different colored eyes and, you know, blue to black to brown. I don't know what this thing's true eye color was. All we could see was this, this orange amber color just literally causing things to light up wherever it looked so it wasn't eye shine it was something internal coming out of this thing and then another uh thing that really has brought me into believing that these are more than than a natural creature and that there is something supernatural going on is when it walked by the fire and it it's it's front hands, paws, whatever you want to call them, had touched the ground near the fire. Um, something happened where its front, it only happened with its front left hand or whatever you want to call it. It, it basically blinked out. It cloaked for a second. And you could see that they see things through it, almost like that predator effect. Um, and when it put its hand down by the fire, something really strange happened aside from the cloak effect if you've ever seen video of the sun and the and the magnetic anomalies and storms that they have on the surface of the of the sun where you see you know the 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 you know tubes come out of it and the different shapes and magnetic storms basically that happened right around its its cloaked out paw and it only happened for about two three seconds enough that i noticed it and my other buddy noticed that the other two did not they were at a different angle and um it had basically just looked around the room it bared its teeth after it sniffed and it snapped its head and looked right up at us. It knew exactly where we were. It finally caught our scent and it looked at us and it looked up at us and it bared its teeth and it growled again and you felt a vibration, but I truly believe that this half concrete wall that we had in front of us had, if it threw that infrasound at us again, I think that that half concrete wall blocked it because we didn't get sick or felt funny or anything. We felt a little vibration. You felt it like I remember I had my, I think it was my right hand on the top of the wall at that time and I felt a little vibration in it, but didn't get sick or anything. So I truly believe that that wall blocked whatever because of the angle of it being down on the first floor us being on the third and it threw it at us i truly think it did and then that stood up again and it, it was almost like um you know uh, like a comic book pose it, it threw its arms out to its sides and it, it its muscles all clenched and it looked at us and it growled and 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 uh, it looked out to the left, it looked to the right, and it saw the stairs on the wall, and it looked back at us, and I got a sinking feeling in my stomach because I knew what it was going to do. It dropped back down on all four, and it ran for the stairs. And, you know, like I had told you, it was missing four stairs, so we had to kind of hop over and climb the wall to get up, and it jumped over that like it, it, it wasn't even there. And it was heading up very fluid um its tail i remember when it ran you could tell it utilized it kind of like a rudder so it was kind of moving when, when it moved its tail kind of bent certain ways its tail reminded me of a mountain lion or a cougar very non-hairy short hair very thick um i remember the bones in its legs and its arms being just gigantically thick and again that sense of not only are we looking at something that's not supposed to exist, the size again is just so massive, it has to be fake. And again, this is really happening. And when it had stood up, I forgot to mention this, it had stood up near one of those concrete pillars that I had mentioned the building had in all four corners. And we had gone back years later, we never went back for years. And we got an idea of how big these pillars were, which gave us an idea of the size estimation of this animal. And when it stood up, it, it basically widthwise blocked out the, the pillar. So it was as wide as the pillar, four to five feet across. And height wise, 
the ceilings were probably where, you know, at the sides where there was floor above, it was probably 15 to 18 feet high. I would guesstimate and my friends guesstimated it was somewhere between 10 to 12 feet tall. So it stood up, its ears probably were at least 12 feet at the tip. And, and, and again, I've heard people describe sizes of, of Sasquatch and, and other cryptids of, of massive size. And, you know, people will say, oh, well, you were kids. Well, we went back as adults. And I'm telling you, we remembered where it stood and, and about, and it had to be minimum 10 feet. I truly think, again, tips of the ears, 11, 12 feet tall. Um, now it's heading up the stairs towards us. Two of my friends are going absolutely ape, ape crap crazy. Um, running, one is running in circles. The one that I had to grab his mouth. He's screaming bloody murder in circles, just running in circles, going nowhere. And he finally jets for the stairs to take him up to the fourth floor. My other friend runs for the fire escape. Again, you can't go down. So only way is up and i'm frozen petrified my other friend standing next to me he just said i was standing next to you i didn't know what to do and it made its way from the first to the second floor in seconds and then it started to head up from the second floor to the third and where i was standing if anybody would have this thing or anyone would have walked up to the top of the stairs the first thing it would have met would have been me and it would have came within two feet of me once it got to the top of the stairs. It got to the middle of the stairs and I started having true belief that this is the day that I'm going to die. I started to think about my family. I, I thought about my dog who I loved very much. Um, I thought about I was getting ready to go into high school to play football at, at, at the unit at the uh, the school uh, Ursuline High School, a Catholic school, very big in the in the sports and, and athletics as well as academics. And my dad had played there. My whole family had gone there. And I was very proud that I was going to be playing football there. And I thought I'm not going to get to play. All this is going through my head. It's all gone. And we're going to watch each one of us truly be mauled and killed by this creature and this is the end I, I really believe this was the day i was gonna die and it was probably within six to seven feet from me when i looked at it and it was looking right at me or at my friend i think it was looking at me because he was behind me and i would have been like again the first one it got to and right at that moment um, I, I, and I will always believe this to the day i die and the sweat starting again. Um, I, I, I believe there was divine intervention. I truly believe it. Uh, I'm Catholic. I, I'm not a great Catholic. I don't go to church a lot. I, I don't practice as much as I should. And, um, but I think that there was divine intervention because once it hit that, that six, seven feet mark from me where it, if it would have jumped, it would have been on me. Um, we heard that a train and whenever a train would come by, we would always get nervous because if they'd see, you know, us in there or the light from a fire, we'd be in big trouble. They would call the police or whoever, and we'd be in trouble. And we had never, ever had a train go by where they laid on the, the horn. And it came by, and as soon as it went by the building, be it from the angle the guy that was driving it saw the inside, what was going on or he just saw the fire which i seem to think he noticed how bright of a fire we had going in there he laid on this one and this thing stopped right six to seven feet from me and it looked at me and it looked back at the opening where you could see the train going by and we're all screaming bloody murder somebody help us help us please save us my other two friends are gone they had you know one went up to the roof the other ran up the stairs i don't know where he was um, my friend and I were screaming, someone help us. And it looked back at us and it looked back again and it turned around and started running down. And it took literally, I would say, one to one and a half seconds to get from where it stood six to seven feet from me at the three quarter mark of that 
second to third floor step area to the to the steps of the going from the second to the first and then something else supernatural happened where you start seeing movement of joints and in the tail and it just was a black streak that left the building and it wasn't just from how fast it was it had basically gone from physical creature to almost shadow and it just was just a black mass had just left the building and it was gone. And I always remember that. And I, and as through the years, the things I've been learning, hearing about shadow people and people, you know, very similar things that I saw and we saw when it did that. And we're screaming and, and, and the train just is, you know, clunk, 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 clunk. And it starts, you know, we're thinking it's slowing down and it wasn't. And it starts getting farther and farther away. And then the hope of we're going to be saved is slowly leaving us. And then it's gone. And then the fear sets back in that this thing's going to turn around and it's going to come back in and it's going to kill us. And by that time, my other two friends had come back down because they heard the train and they heard us screaming help. And I think that they thought that, you know, um, everything was going to be all right. And, and people were coming for us. And, and they almost, my one buddy almost had kind of a, a, almost a half smile on his face. And when, when we all looked at each other, we were, everybody was pale white and, and, and just so weak from the experience already that, that, you know, we just want to, I wanted to curl up in a ball and just, just lay there and the fear set back in, it's going to come back in. And, an hour goes by and we're still up there and it didn't. And then we start talking to each other, you know, it's after 10 o'clock. We have to get out of here because this thing's going to eventually come back. And my friend that had lost it and that we had to shut up is, is totally postal crying, screaming. I just want to go home. I want my mom and dad, please God help us. And, and we're trying to calm him down and he won't. And, and we're like, listen, we have to go. He's like, no, we can't go out there. It's going to be waiting for us. It's going to be there. And we all thought that, but then again, the fear of as each minute clicks by, we're giving this thing the opportunity. If it did run away, to come back and see if we're still there or it knows we're still there, it's outside just watching. And we kept looking at the space between this makeshift wall and the and the opening of the building where there was concrete looking for those orange eyes shining out there and we couldn't see them. And it was hard to see, but if it was looking at us, it was so bright, we would have saw it. And so we finally decided, okay, we we have to at least go down to the second floor. And my friend is just going crazy and, and we're dragging him with us. We pull him down the second floor and we're probably up there for maybe half an hour. And then we go down to the first and we say, we have to make a run for it. We have to go. We have to go now. It's almost 11 o'clock at night. You know, we're in, a, in, a, in, a, in an old steel mill in downtown Youngstown. I mean, this is not where you want to be, even if there's not a, 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 a mythological creature trying to hunt you down and kill you. So we're like, we have to get out of here. And we just remembered then. I remember thinking, oh, my God, we have we have weapons. But I'm telling you, Josh, there is no way on God's green earth that if even with me having a 38 on me that they would it would have done nothing but anger this thing I thank God we didn't ever pull them out or shoot at it or anything I don't think we could have even hit it number one we were so horrified number two it would have done nothing it would have just pissed it off and it would have it would have mauled us even worse so we start to leave we have to go I mean I am sweating I'm sorry um surprised i haven't cried yet i usually break a little bit oh um, dude your stories woo! It, it's it's it's, it's it, affecting it's me man i'm like haunted. i'm all choked up go ahead so, go keep going finally we start to leave and my, my friend is screaming bloody murder please don't let don't let us go out there it's going to kill us and i grabbed them and i'm sorry i have to use my language i grabbed them i said listen to me i said you are going to come with us or we're going to leave you here to die. You are going to come with us or it's going to come in here and it will kill you. 
and you will be here alone. We will leave you here. You either come with us now or you will stay. And he's screaming, don't leave me, don't leave me. So finally, we, we turned around, me and my friend. We took his hand and he grabbed both of our shirts and he's strangling us, pulling on our shirts. And we had to literally pull him out of the building to get out there. We get out to the concrete outcropping and the fear sets in also because what I had forgotten to mention was when you climb up, you could look underneath and it would go way back into the building. So it was very, very reasonable to think that this thing was underneath waiting for us to drop and then it, was, it would be over and no one would hear us. It could maul each of us, take its time. No one would have ever heard us. And even if they heard screams in the, in the downtown area or up by the high, no one would know where they were coming from. So we jump down and we start taking off and, and we're going as fast as we can. My buddy's choking us to death. Finally, we get him to the point where he's running on his own and we're all running together, almost arm in arm together in a straight line. And it takes a half an hour to get to my friend's house from that blast furnace. So that's a half an hour of complete and utter terrorizing fear that we were in with every noise, every pebble one of us kicked, every time the wind would pick up and leaves would blow, we would think it was there, it was behind us, it was chasing us, we'd turn around and stop and look around. We finally got to the last portion of where we could get out of this area. And what it was was a, a hill, literal hill of gravel and just material that going down was easy. You could turn your feet to the side, standing up and just walk yourself down slowly. Going up, you had to go up on all fours. And we would always laugh at each other. We would always, you know, make fun of whoever was the first that would start sliding down because we would always lose our food. They would always go out from under us and it would take us longer and it was exhausting to get up having this gravel coming out from under your hands and feet. So now we're crawling up this pile of gravel, this huge mountain of, of gravel, and each one of us at different times, because we're trying to go as fast as we can, start to slide down and the fear sets in that it's behind us, it's gonna get us. And numerous times, each one of us screamed, is it behind me, is it behind me? You know, and you turn around and you look and it wouldn't be there, you'd expect to see it. We finally got up there, me and my one buddy made it first and we helped our other friends, we pulled them up and we ran across the highway and we went uh, over the fence and across the street and to my buddy's house that lived across and his parents weren't home. And um, I remember, I, I, this just always sticks out to me. He had a hose and I remember turning the hose on and I just drank and drank and drank until my stomach felt like it was gonna pop. And I just poured it all over my head and each one of us did the same thing. And then we just sat on the porch and on the stairs, my other buddy was in the front yard and each one of us in a complete and utter daze, not talking for at least an hour at least, staring across out towards where we had come from we couldn't see the area obviously it was so far but we're just stand just staring just in shock in disbelief um my, my one friend who had lost it he didn't talk for two weeks he had to go start seeing a psychiatrist um i had major problems i started to go uh, you know, I, I, I belong, I'm half Lebanese. We belong to St. Mary's Church. If you're from the Youngstown area, you know it. It's a, it's a, um, it's a church there that Lebanese go to. And um, I went there and I talked to the, to the priest there and I told him about what happened, you know, and I expected, um, you know, the priest did not believe me or say anything. And he believed me immediately. And he had told me, Matthew, he said, you need to understand something. First and foremost, he said, God saved your lives. He said, I believe there was divine intervention. And he said, secondly, you need to understand that there are things in this world that most people have no clue about, any idea. And he mentioned exorcisms specifically. And he said, there are demons in this world. And the church, it is well known, you know, 
you go all the way to Italy and, and Rome and, and they teach, you know, they have their top notch exorcists that go all over the world for the most horrible demon exorcisms. And he mentioned maybe it was a demon or something, but he had given the impression and that he knew what it was. And he was not surprised at all that we saw something like this. And, you know, the priest had said, sometimes these things bleed into our world and they take some of us and some of us are lucky enough to get away or they just don't bother us and he said but there are a long-standing history of things that aren't supposed to exist existing in this world and he said i believe you and i cried i mean i broke down and you know it wasn't you know why would it why would a child go to a priest and make up a story like that and you know we had talked about obviously the situation of us having to address this with our families and we all agreed, there's four of us, we would always be with each other when we spoke to our parents together so that we could be there to back each other up. Well, two of my buddy's parents had no, they, you guys are full of crap, they didn't wanna hear it, just get out of here, go do what you're gonna do. My parents, my mom walked out of the room, you're crazy, she didn't wanna hear it. My dad, however, knew me and looked at me and and said well you know maybe maybe you guys saw a bear maybe it was a bear with mange or maybe it was you know some some mutated creek you know normal animal a bear he kept saying bear because we kept telling him how big it was and what would you compare it to and we you know we talked about a polar bear it was as big as a polar bear but it didn't look like a polar bear it looked like a wolf it looked like a, a man-shaped wolf but it was giant and he just kept saying, well, you guys saw something, you know, you're four, they're 14 year old kids. They saw, you know, something natural. They just don't know what it is. Then my best friend's dad, who I'm not going to out him, he's, he's passed away. So I'm not going to out him and his family because I'm very close to them. But all I'm going to say is, and any of my friends that see this, or they know who I'm talking about and what his dad did. He, he, he basically was in charge of the city. He was in charge of the police and many other parts of it. And we told him his mom did the same thing mine did. She just said, you guys are crazy. You saw you saw a big dog or whatever. And she left the room and she didn't want to hear it. And his dad, however, got very upset. And he he gave us the impression that he knew what we were talking about. And he first and foremost went off on us and said, you know, choice was what the hell are you guys doing down there? You could get killed down there. The place is falling apart. He said, people put bodies down there. There was a couple homeless people that were mauled by packs of dogs down and he brought that up, which makes me wonder, was it really a pack of dogs that mauled these two homeless men? Was it? I, I don't know. I don't know. After seeing what I saw and we saw, I, I can't guarantee it. But he didn't want to talk about it anymore. He warned us, if you ever go back down there, he said, I promise you, I will put you in JJC. He said, you will not play football at, at, at Ursula Matt. He looked at me, right? He said, you think that you'll play? He says, your coach will never allow you to play. You're, he'll think you're crazy. He said, you guys will go, you know, you'll go to the city school, which is right in high school. He said, you won't go to Ursula. You won't go to that school. You'll go to the city school and you guys will be made fun of the rest of your lives and you'll be the joke of Youngstown. And he called my father and I'm going to say something here. My older sister, I, I told her about this recently. My parents are gone and I, I've never, I've never really told anybody in my family about this other than my dad because of what happened when my dad was called to my friend's house and my sister and I got into it. This was just recently. And she looked at me and she said, ah, what are you talking about? She goes, what do you mean? She goes, how did we never hear about this? She says, why didn't mom or dad tell us about this? You, what are you talking? You know, she was denying that, that I'm telling the truth. I'm looking at her, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a 50 year old man. You think I'm going to lie to you? You're my sister. What, what are you, are you Chris? So we got into it. And I, I'm being honest about this. And if she hears it, she can admit it. We got into it. And I was very upset about this, but the reason I didn't talk about it, especially, and I'm sure my younger brother, who's only a year younger than me, is, is not going to be happy about this when he finds out because we were best friends growing up. We were inseparable. But when my best friend's dad called my father to come, he sat us down 
and he talked to my dad my dad's name was ken and he said ken he said you know the situation here he said if these boys go around talking about it number one all their classmates are going to go down there somebody's going to get killed just from getting hurt from the buildings and everything he said secondly he said your son is going to be the joke of his school he won't play ball and he looked at me and, and he had this look of oh man and he said you have to promise me that you make your son not talk about this he doesn't tell your sibling his siblings about this you don't talk to your wife about this and he pulled my dad aside and they went in the kitchen and they talked and when i went home my dad kept looking at me with and i you know my dad and i were super ultra close we called each other best buddy he, we were close, all of the kids, five kids in my family, we all had special relationships with my parents, but me and my dad had the closest. And he kept looking at me with this just fear in his face that I kept telling him, I'm crying hysterically, dad, you have to believe me. This is what we saw. And he kept looking at me like, Jesus, you know, I mean, he, I think he's telling the truth. And after what my friend's dad said to him is when he really got scared, and he said, you, you can't tell your sisters and brothers about this. Don't talk about it with your young, with my brother, my younger brother. He kept saying, don't tell him, don't him, because we were inseparable. He said, you can't tell him. He said, you're, he's not going to be able to sleep. You're going you're gonna to cause problems. So he put the fear of God in me, and so did my buddy's dad. A week later, my best friend tells me, he finally got his dad to sit down with him and talk. And he said, he knows what it is. He said he told him that, that his officers had gotten calls about these things. He had two officers that had seen it and that he knows all about it. And he gave him the implication that it at least had killed one of those two people that had been mauled in, in the downtown uh, Steel Mill area that were homeless people living in that area. He said he basically told me that he knew everything about it. Don't ever go back down there. You guys are lucky to be alive. And we just were like, whoa, finally somebody is giving us credence and believing us. And I felt this sense of, oh my God, we're not crazy. We didn't see a bear. We're not just little kids that don't know what's going on. This is real and this is crazy. So, um, you know, over the years, I've learned, obviously, been just completely just just stuck on what happened. I think about it every day. Um, and the older I've gotten, the more I've gotten more involved in the cryptic community. I met you. I met Josh Turner and and Barton Nunley, and and you know I've I've talked to other people like Wes Germer and, and Tony Merkel, and you know these guys all making the same face that you're making right now, a little pale with your hand over your mouth, and um, you know. This is not, anybody can believe what they want. And, and I'm talking to anybody watching this right now. I'm looking at you right now. You can believe whatever you want. You can think that this is entertainment because in the end of the day, this channel's for entertainment. But let me tell you something. I will go to my grave. I'm giving you pertinent personal information about myself and where I live and my family and the schools I went to and the area I grew up into. This happened. This was real. I, you know, I, I have no reason to make myself look like a crazy person or, or, or just somebody looking for attention. This really happened. You can think I'm crazy if you want, but let me tell you something. You look at all of the instances of people are having more and more experiences these days. And because of media, we're hearing more about them and you're getting more information out than ever. There's stuff going on. And I've heard some experiencers out there that uh, I, it's cringeworthy and it's obvious they're making it up. But I've heard stuff over the years, especially the last couple of years. And when I talked to Josh Turner at, at, at Paranormal Roundtable and he told me about his experience and what him and his cousin saw, it was almost exactly what I saw. And I had never met him before. I had never talked to Josh before until I told my experience and I got the fear of God in me again. And right now I'm, I'm nervous. I have anxiety in my chest. I'm sweating. My shirt's starting to show it. I keep wiping sweat from me. I usually crack a tear or two. I'm surprised I haven't. This, there are things out there that people don't want to believe are real. There are. 
and I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just telling you, this is what happened. If there was one person, you can question. There were four of us, four of us, okay, four. We all talked about it for years. Two of my friends are gone. God rest their souls. And they had issues for years and they started doing other things that ended, ended their lives prematurely that I believe was because of what happened to us. My other friend refuses to discuss it. He has a very successful business. He, he thanks me all the time whenever we talk that I have the guts to talk about this. He's afraid to talk about it. He also, he to this day has severe PTSD and doesn't even like to discuss it more than five minutes. Um, it, it really happened. I, I don't know what else to say. Um, I, I'm not going to make a fool of myself, uh, you know, in front of thousands of people because a lot of people are going to see this. And I've done other shows and people have seen it. There's no reason for me to lie. And anybody that knows me personally that will see this, you know who I am. I'm not a liar. I'm not a crazy person. I'm not somebody that makes up fantastical stories. This happened and it almost ended our lives. And people need to know that these things are real and they're still out there. People are telling, you know, their experiences and I hear, you know, uh, similarities. I've heard some recently, uh, you know, some guy mentioned one uh, about the raccoon hands and that, that made me stop. And he mentioned a couple other things and, um, you know, it, it was really crazy and I, I had, um, something happened to me. This is the first time I've ever going to share this. Uh, I've never shared this on any other show. Um, about three and a half weeks ago, almost a month, um, I had a dream that was the realest dream I've ever had in my life. Um, normally in your dream, when you think you're at home, it's not your home. I was at home. I was in my backyard. Um, I heard something. We have woods behind our house. I heard something in the woods. I went to the woods and, you know, I, I lost my right leg below the knee last April. I had some complications, uh, health issues from surgeries and um, I have a prosthetic and I remember something attacked me from behind and threw me on the ground and I saw what it was and it was what I saw all those years ago and it ripped off my pant leg and it threw my prosthetic into the woods and then it got on top of me and it crawled over top of me and it was 100 percent the thing i saw when i was 14 and it crawled over me and the eyes were glowing and it was dripping saliva it dripped in my mouth and i mean like i've gagged to telling people this story a couple times i tasted it i could smell it it looked at me and it did what i've heard people mention some cryptids do which is mind speak basically talking to you in your head and it put its head maybe two inches from me and it, it looked at me and it started speaking to me in my mind and it could have been just the ultra realistic dream but i'm telling you then it was the realest dream of my life and it told me in my dream that i've been talking too much about it that it's been looking for me for a long time and it was there for me all those years ago and that it will see me again someday. And then I woke up and I was sweating. My puppy, her name's Hadley, was at the foot of my chair. I was soaking wet. She was standing there. She's normally never there. It was like 3.30 in the morning. She's always up in bed with my wife. And she's at the foot of my chair whining with her front paws on my legs, looking at me like, what's wrong? And, and I'm telling you, Maybe it was just an ultra realistic dream, but I'm telling you, it was the realest dream I've ever had in my life. And it was 100% what I saw all those years ago. Now, maybe it's just because I, I, I've told the story a few times um, and, and I'm sorry, it's not a story. It's an experience. I have to, I have to designate those two because there are stories out there and they're just that stories. This was an experience and Maybe because I had been I had been talking about it recently. I'd so I'd met you for the first time at, at uh, Josh's uh, Cryptid conference in Texas, and um, you know it, it just I met people there that had seen things, and and I I don't think it was a dream. It was too real. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. <sighs> that that's basically what has gone down. Um, I've had some other things happen. 
Um, I think I told you, I even sent you uh, an audio clip. I had went to uh, Beaver Creek uh, State Park. If I didn't, I'll send it to you. Um, I had went there for a, a Bigfoot conference a few months ago, which is in Ohio. Um, the night before the conference, I had met a guy named Johnny Freeman, who's a psychic. You can look him up online. He's on Facebook. He came up to me. I never met the man in my life. Uh, he came up to me and told me I needed to go up this sketchy trail. Now, I had just had my left knee replaced. I have a prosthetic on my right leg. He tells me I need to go up this trail. There's a there's supposedly a portal up at the top of this trail. And I looked at him and first I'm like, you know, he has his hand on my arm. I'm like, bro, slow your roll. I don't know who you are. What are you talking about? I can't just go up some trail. I've got half a leg. I just had my knee replaced. He said, I'm sorry. He says, I've never seen someone with an aura like you before. He says, you need to go up this, this trail. There's a reason. And I go up this trail. It took me probably 35, 40 minutes and nothing visual happened at the end of me being there talking out loud. I made a, a, an EVP. I'd never done an EVP before. I've seen all the ghost shows and everything. And I pulled out my phone and I started recording the app and, um, I basically had asked questions out loud, and this is online. You could go to Cryptid Creatures, uh, which is a, 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 um, another cryptid site where um, my buddy Todd Erie and Brian Brock uh, interviewed me. They upped the sounds on this recording, if you want to hear it. And I'm not trying to plug somebody else there, Josh. Sorry. No, you're um, talking about it, buddy. It's on there, and you can hear it, and you hear basically a grunt, which – Everybody I played it from Ron Moorhead, who is a legend in the Bigfoot community, um, to Martin Groves, Martin Groves, who is a legend and is like a father to me. And I love the man. We've talked and sat down. He has, in my opinion, the most memorable, most insane experience of dogmen and Bigfoot that you've ever heard. If you haven't heard it, we sat down at the conference where I met you and we became very close and we looked at each other with fear in our eyes because of the of the similarities to what we had both seen and we had never met before. So, um, you know, you hear on this thing, you hear a grunt, you hear wood knocks. I didn't hear them with my own ears. You can hear them on this recording. Martin Groves will tell you about him and I and about us meeting and the similarities. And it's not fake. So that, that's that's what's happened. I've had some crazy stuff connected with me through the years. Um, I've always had a sensitivity to things. I've noticed details that most people don't over the years. And I freak my family out sometimes doing things. And um, I, I don't know, maybe it's just I'm sensitive like some people. And, you know, there's that veil that break our world from the supernatural world. And I think some of us are just capable sometimes to see things that others can. I think that this thing broke through, like my priest told me, uh, it bled through and we just happened to be there. It did not like that we were there and I think it tried to remove us. And um, that's that's what went down and that's when I've gone through over the years and things are still kind of happening on and off and nothing of that severity, um, but definitely weird. Wow. There you go. Um... You took me through a roller coaster, man. Uh, it's, it's been crazy. You know, being at that conference, hearing Martin Groves' experience was utterly terrifying. Your, you guys, I'd say, are like right around. The, I, I've only ever heard, I guess, when I say a handful, I mean like less than six. Hey, it's that you know me. Everyone know, knows what I do. My channel. I've gone through so. Man, and there's a lot of stories and accounts that never even made it to the channel that I've never talked to anybody out. Mm -hmm. But there, there is three in particular that, that, that are now that yours being one of them as far as one of the most emotionally taxing stories that I've ever endured because of the, the – it's not just how good you were able to tell, but, but the level of fear that I could feed off of. You, you got a little pale there for a minute. It, I'll admit it was it. genuine. Yeah, I, I yeah. It, it honestly shook me. There's only a few stories that genuinely shook me. Um, Martin's was another, mm. and then there was another gentleman. Unfortunately, it, it wasn't a video. I, I didn't get to hear it in person, but uh, you might know what I'm talking about. It's it's a gentleman who had an experience back in Kentucky. I want to say it was around the '80s too, similar to yours. 
he had gone in with a couple of friends into it was like an old flooded out hospital. I don't remember where in Kentucky it was. They were down in the basement where the old morgue was. And and then this is just off off my memory. He goes in one of the uh one of the pull out panels or something, or, he, or he's on something and he hears something come in and go down the ladder and he thinks it's his friends. Well, long story short, I can't give you the, the good version because I don't really remember. It's been a while. Anyway, this thing comes in and it chases him through the bottom part. And it, it's so much like you described. I mean, you hear, you hear, you could see the fear as you're reading that, like how he typed and explained. And long story short, he was able to make it out. This thing nearly chased after him. He runs across the street to some lady's house. He's frantic. He doesn't know what's going on. Anyway, and so it, there's a little. I'll have to send you uh, the story because it's like, oh my Please. gosh. And, yeah, I've uh, never heard of. I don't know, man. I'm kind of like having to process like what I just endured <laughs> to like I begin that. to like. Okay, let, let let me start to dissect this and like understand like where do I even? I, I'm nauseated right now. I'll be honest. Yeah, with you. I'm sick in my stomach. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy um, to tell it. No, no. And like you said, it, this isn't a laughing matter. It's not not for no. anything. Like this is a genuine not at experience. All. Someone. Okay, so let me first start by asking. Okay, so you said that, that what, what time of night? Uh, what time of night do you, would you say this was? When when we started the fire, I would say it was probably somewhere between nine fifteen, nine thirty at night, nine p.m., nine thirty. Um, when we heard the dogs, I would probably say it was roughly maybe twenty to ten quarter tail, somewhere in that time frame. Okay, so it's dark. It's yeah. Oh, dark. completely. We yeah, one hundred percent dark. So this thing climbs up there. I, I, how, how could you maintain composure with something that resembles a werewolf from 20 feet away? <laughs> Again, it was – Shock it was, probably? It was shock. It was complete fear, and we were frozen. Um, and again, I, I, I just – I repetitively say this. It was just that it was so – I wasn't we were in shock and it was again you know what I keep going back to was that that just that thought of this can't be really happening it's it's so big it's fake that we have to be dreaming this can't be real and that's something that just kept constantly going through our mind and my mind and they told me they also thought like they were dreaming it just how is this possible what is this in front of us and, and, and it just was this thought constant thought that went through my head it's fake i'm gonna wake up sometime this is a dream and then, then we never woke up it, it, it really it really went down i know you described almost in vivid detail um what it's physical you know the physical aesthetics of it uh I'm going to backtrack real quick just for a second go back to the three encounters that I mentioned. Now, the one I forgot, this is the fourth one, is um, the guy who shot, you know what I'm talking about, the guy who shot the Bigfoot through, or the dog went through the truck? Yeah, yes. Yeah. What do you think about that that encounter? Um, he he told some, some uh, similarities as well. Um, it, it didn't sound quite as big as the one you know I, I i've heard you know and you have two stories of of maybe alpha bigfoot and things like that. i think this thing was like an alpha because it was just so long and massive and giant and all the all the comparisons i've heard have been bigger than human but not to that size right and this thing just seemed abnormally even big from some of the things i truly believe from what i've learned and heard about about most sasquatch the one that that thing that we saw i would put my money on that one i really would i don't think there's many things out there that could handle this thing it was it was created for being from whoever the devil um demons whoever as just the, the the alpha predator this thing was created for one thing and it was to to be a predator have you seen any sort of werewolf depiction that can even closely resemble other than the van yep. helsing werewolf yeah you just touched on it right there that's it <laughs> That's yeah. what you saw. The one that Hugh Jackman turned into specifically, because there's two in that movie. The one at the beginning, the the one lady's brother turns into one that's kind of whitish, gray colored. She asks him not to shoot it at the beginning of the movie. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. I don't him. remember that. It's been a long time, but we yeah, all Yeah, there's one at the, the beginning. Massive, the weightlifter, yeah. I would say. 
Bettina, I did Bettina's show, and I told her too that when Hugh Jackman turned into the werewolf, the black one, that's the closest thing that I have seen that can compare. His was a little more human-like. This wasn't as human-like as that was. This was more something out of like a, 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 a out of like a comic book or something it was just the arms just so insanely long it's its fingers were reaching almost to its ankles um its arms were just so long it was just like freaky that's one of the freakiest things for me was in the hands these these black kind of just super long like like raccoon hands it was freaky have you seen uh gosh there's a there's a dogman depiction and i want to say it's have you ever seen the uh, the vic kind of dogman and his thing um i've seen some of them I, I don't know which one you're referring to uh yeah let me pull up it's the one this guy right here and so when you're mentioning arm length that's kind of what i'm thinking of what i envision yeah oh, there we go yeah very similar yeah so i would imagine yes. the uh what do you call it? the um the Hugh Jackman dogman, but arms like that, just like yes. over exaggerated hands and arms that are like, like, well, like super long. Hands. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. But that's were, a really good depiction. Yeah. Were the eyes like that though, where you could see pupils and it was kind of like glowing. Um, yeah, yeah they were, they were, I can't really see it there, but yeah. they were just, Josh, they were so bright. Like I'm telling you, when it was when it was walking around the building, even with the fire on there, when it like would turn its head towards the wall, you'd see the light from its eyes almost light up a little portion of area on the ground in the low part of the wall where it was. So it had some type of of internal something going on there that caused those eyes to shine like that. It was not eye shine. No way. You mentioned you were in the remnants of an old steel mill. And obviously we're talking about a building that is very dilapidated, mm -hmm. very probably has pockets that are open, which you can kind of see through each floor, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously parts of walls that were missing, which allowed you guys to kind of do what you did. I don't know. I'm sure it was for the steel making process, like in the very, very bottom. It had this tunnel. I didn't go in it because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to pull my big butt out of there. They went in it and they said it was super cold. It went the length of the building, maybe longer. I, I, I had to be filled with, you know, I would say smelting material or whatever, even the liquid metal at one point. Um, but something I also didn't mention is there is a, a, a riverside park that's almost like a state park called mill creek park that's just very close to that miles away that follows the mahoning river that goes through the park and the mahoning river goes all the way down through the downtown area and through the steel mill area that it could have easily been up in this mill creek park and followed the water all the way through down to the steel mill area or it makes you wonder, you always hear about dogmen specifically being around like India, Indian burial mounds, maybe there was a burial mound around there somewhere that they had built over, you know, I don't know, maybe. But Ohio is definitely one of those states that has a ton of burial mounds in it. Yeah. Um... I apologize because, like I said, your story had such an impact on me that I'm kind of oh, like, when it comes to like, you know, when it comes to asking the really good questions, I'm like, okay, it, it's one of those things where I feel like you gave so much detail and really spilled out the story. I feel like this is more discussion versus like, well, what yeah. was this like? You know, because some people- You're not the here. first to say that to me. And I really? think that's why I've I've happily looked at a lot of comments through the, through the last year and a half, two years that I've talked about it. And I've never seen one yet where people have been like, yeah, right. Everybody has said, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy about the fact that I've given people a, a sense of believability because you know, I, I'm being 100% honest with everyone. I, yeah. I have no reason to lie, Josh. I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I've made friends with you. I appreciate that you and I have, have started a friendship. I have no reason to lie about this shit. 
this stuff really went down, man. And 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 I hope I, I relay the believability because I'm telling it from firsthand experience and I'm giving my emotions in this and I'm honest to God, nauseated right now from telling that story again, because it brings me back. How did you cope with this experience after? <sighs> Uh, you know, I, I went to my priest, probably I asked my dad to take me there. He knew why. Um, my dad, after a while, started trying to be there as much as he could for me, but I don't think he really knew how to, um, to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I still to this day have some PTSD from it. You know, obviously I'm sweating my, I mean, my shirt, you can see it, it's, it's wet. Like it's wet, you know, I don't know if you can see that, but um, I, I don't know. I, I, I've just tried to deal with it through the years as much as I could. I went to see a priest. I've had, I, I, you know, I've had anxiety and PTSD problems, not only from that, but from some of my health issues. Um, so I've been on different antidepressants and stuff for years that, that start from that. Yeah, and not many of them have ever done anything for me. You had mentioned that which is really interesting that you mentioned the train and then it looked back that the, 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 well okay there's two things i want to touch upon before i i forget because like i'm so in the zone with you that i don't want to trail off the first no, thing no. i want to talk about is when you look into its eyes and i want to talk about like did you perceive any intelligence and what that was like so let's touch that and then remind me that the second part is i want to talk about as it left and it kind of like morphed into a shadow apparition mm -hmm. and then vanished so let's, let's talk let's talk about the eyes and the intelligence first what if anything uh, tell me about that i definitely got a sense that it knew you know what was going on um it had a, an intelligence um I, I truly believe that it threw that infrasound at us outside to cause us problems to, to make us have issues i think it wanted to get rid of us because it did not expect us to be there. It was surprised. And, and you know, when my buddy had, had hit that makeshift wall and, and it and across the concrete and it looked at us, its eyes got real wide at first. Like it was like, whoa, okay. And then it, it got the, the fierce look on its face. Like, what are you doing here? And why are you looking at me? And, and it, it, it gave me a sense that it, it, it wanted to remove us it, it, and, and it wasn't happy we were there. Um, things like, you know, it sniffed the air and it looked right at us and it growled and it looked at the stairs and it looked back at us almost to kind of say, I know how to get to you and I'm coming. And it went and it hit the stairs and it flew up the stairs like it was barely touching the ground. It was moving so fast. And, you know, one of the things I didn't touch on is, you know, it, it moved a lot like a, a panther or a great cat does, like real smooth and beautiful almost, even though it's scary, Fluid. it has a beauty to it. Yeah, almost like it's liquid metal or oil or something. And it just just moved just in it. it transitioned from four to two and back so simple i've i've heard stories like um these woods are haunted have you ever watched that show on discovery plus you know it, the one guy that was in the in the in the swamp and saw the three dog men and he said when it stood up it popped its joints were popping and you know other people have talked about popping noises wondering if it's not joints if it's these things coming through a portal or something i don't know i heard no noise it did not look like it had any issue standing on two legs. It was as happy on two as it was on four. And it definitely showed intelligence in its eyes. It knew where we were. It knew how to get to us. It had no problem doing it. And it almost seemed at first that it was almost enjoying scaring us, almost like there was a, a almost like a sick pleasure it was getting from, from you know, coming for us. Chasing and it made it almost, yeah, almost made it seem like it was, it was, you know, drawing it out. And you hear, you know, some of those messed up stories about, um, you know, aliens that are eating people or, or cryptids or something, or they say that, I'm sure you've heard the stories about people saying that, that they say the meat is sweeter when they're afraid. Yep. That's the sense I got.
It's it, that is the adrenochrome. So when you are under intense intense and, and any any trauma, so generally torture is the best way to release adrenochrome, <laughs> physical torture. Um, but any sort of severe emotional or physical trauma causes your brain. And someone might be able to cry. I might be wrong on this, but I'm like 99% sure. Yeah, you release adrenochrome. It's the reason why I'm going to get dark here for a second. And, and, and a lot of, unfortunately, satanic rituals, like we're talking human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. There's something you, you, and this is also true with, um, I've heard with, with, with possession for uh, occultists who practice like possessing individuals, you bring them to the brink. Um, I don't, I don't want to say it's death. But it, it, it's such extreme trauma that the brain, uh, it changes the chemistry of the brain to where spiritually they're able to imprint um, things. But that that's a whole other rabbit hole that I'm not going to go down. Just I've heard it, though. Uh, I've heard what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, the reason it's related is because when you when you experience that adrenochrome goes into the blood, then if you were to kill whoever, whatever it is, that's in the blood and for uh, stories like, you know, being abducted or whatnot, supposedly they get high off it. And mm -hmm. um it's also I, I've heard in Eastern countries, and I'm talking like India and countries surrounding there, and I don't know what particular cultures practice it or how long it's been practiced, but I've heard that with certain animals, they will tie them up by their feet, and I don't know what physical torture they they do to the animal, but but they will beat the animal or worse to get that happen. I don't know if they go for they. I think it's just adrenaline. Anyway, it, it may yeah. it, it changes the chemistry of the meat. And they say the meat tastes better. So a little little, little side note yeah. there, but it is interesting when you hear about that. You're like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, this also goes in line with what we're talking about. This is uh, I'm like I'm a dog and a cat guy. So this is, I, I was gonna do an episode on this, but I'm like, you know, I just <laughs> it's just a little too a little too dark for me. But uh, there there's a cult in. Scotland, and it starts with a T. I can't pronounce it. It's like Treg something, Treg. I don't know. Anyway, their whole thing was that they would summon these these demonic apparitions. They would. I don't know where they'd get this amount of cats, but they would somehow gather up a very large amount. Of, I don't know if they're stray cats, whatnot. And the grisly part is that they, they would torture these cats to the point of death. And they, they would do this for four days and four nights straight. Oh. And apparently at that point, they would be they would able to have the, these entities that would actually take the form of a large black cat. I'm giving a very summarized, small mm -hmm. version of, of the whole story. But uh, anyway, they were able to to have like um, second sight from, from these supernatural entities. So there's a lot that ties into what you're saying. Um, and it goes back to like the whole like burning things. They would they would slowly burn these cats alive over the course of oh, the long yeah. until. And yeah, just so yeah, I'm an animal person too. Yeah, it, it, yeah, horrific. It was really hard to read. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I, I'm gonna opt out yeah. on that one. But uh, anyway, but but it kind of goes back to saying that like, yeah, they. I don't know why they would do that, but or why cats specifically. But anyway, it, there is a correlation. Something something is happening, and, and so it makes it weird when you're talking to me about how how much expression and how intelligent these things seems and how like when it looks at you you kind of get that understanding like this is this isn't like just a wild animal like th no. there's something far higher intelligent here but there's, yeah, there's like a something wild animal to it right it, it's still yeah. like it's not it's not animal it's not human it's something else no i i truly believe it's supernatural it's not now it's not completely natural there's a supernatural you know feature going on there and you know going to what you were mentioning you know about it leaving the building um when that train came and and you know again this this showed signs of intelligence that it looked back and it looked at the train and then it looked back at us almost like mm, you know like damn it and then it, it, it took a little half inch step towards me and then it turned around and it left like it was pissed off. It was like, damn it. And it left and then hit that, it hit that last set of stairs. And Josh, I'm telling you, man, I saw the physical aspect of it leaving from where it was close from me. And then when it hit that last set of stairs, it went from a physical being to a a shadow leaving the building I, 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 that's the only explanation i can say it was just and it, it wasn't so fast that it was just a flash it was literally it just dissipated and left in like a giant shadow it just shaped barely shaped like the creature that it was 
So it just was like shaped like that huge thing, wolf, uh, dog man on all fours running down. It hits that last set of stairs and then just barely shaped like it and shadow out the wall and it's gone. And that's what happened. And we all went over it. We all went over this for years with each other. And each one of us were standing at a different angle. So, you know, what I'm telling you is uh, it's like a, a, a grouping of what each one of us saw put together. So I saw a bulk of it, but there were little pieces here and there that I've added into my experience that we spoke of together through the years. Yeah, but you know what I saw, Matt? This is what I saw from where I was standing. Oh, really? Okay. Then you didn't see this. No, there were two of us that saw that cloak out happen with its left front arm, paw, whatever. And the other two didn't see that, but the other two had noticed, um, like the, 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 shape of its hands like i never saw any claws my one buddy did see said he saw shine of claws he also agreed like the length of the hands and and we both said to each other in unison i remember when we were talking about it, raccoon and we both said raccoon hands at the same time and you know my one other buddy had talked with me i noticed a little bit of the the rudder like kind of motion of the tail when it was running up the stairs and he noticed that too and he said when it when it turned to the right so when it's when it was closest to the to the wall he said i noticed more than ever its tail bent and turned to the left almost like a rudder helping it you know stay even keel on the stairs and go up better. So it was just little things like that. We all saw basically the same stuff, just tiny little snippets each one of us saw from a little different angle that made the, the, the experience more detailed for all of us. When that <clears throat> thing cloaked, it reminds me of, uh, like you said, of the Predator and on all the other stories that have come out over the last couple few years especially and then hearing it even from josh is just people seeing these entities coming out of portals and, mm -hmm. and and going in and out of cloaking it and it's so weird because if you were to talk about this not even five ten twenty years ago it, it sounds like you're talking about a science fiction film mm -hmm. there's just no way this this could even represent our reality in any way and so it's like how do you how do you even process what you experience i mean this is also a rhetorical question as well as it's as well as it's an actual question to you it's like how do you even begin to even process other than like try to cope with it and tell people about it but like how do you how do you internalize that and be like this this really happened like oh my gosh and then to understand that there's things like this out there and yeah. then hearing all these other stories to validate that like how does that yeah. feel Probably it, it, it's horrifying um it, it's a very lonely feeling and I've died, like I would just felt so lonely and alone and just, you know, even though my buddies, you know, but when I, we weren't living together. So when we're not together, you know, I'm by myself. So I'm like, I can't tell you how many times over the years, you know, we lived in a big old house on the north side of Youngstown. We had the, in the basement, those set of stairs that, you know, like, behind it something could be sitting and could reach out and grab you i used to book up those stairs even as a teenager i would run up those stairs because i would be freaked out and thinking this thing was under the stairs or something so i i've had issues for years with this and it took me a while to decide to tell this and if it wasn't for me just watching YouTube and watching stuff like yours and, and the other channels, um, I, I wouldn't have, have finally said, you know what, fuck it. I, I'm gonna tell that it really happened. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hide this anymore. Well, my goal, I'm not ending it right here, by the way, but I'm just, I wanna say that my goal is that we can get thousands of people to hear your story. And, you know, it, it's like with the Joe Barger thing. There's a lot of people that say, well, I'm, and listen, I get it, I get it. But at the same time, there are there are thousands of other people who most of the time are not going to comment or say anything. They're going to see that. They're going to be affected by it. Like, oh, my gosh, there's someone mm -hmm. else like me. Now I can finally come out with right. what I experienced. You know, I agree. And so um, or at least to feel that, hey, they're not alone or at least to be aware. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like there, this is there's something because when you're more yeah, aware, 
Yeah, go ahead. You know, Josh, you've heard too, I'm sure, you know, all of, especially lately over the last few years about, you know, people in government and things that are coming out talking about things, saying oh, yeah. how the movie industry is purposely giving us snippets of real information. People think it's all science fiction, but there's a lot of reality in some of these movies that are being put out. I 100% believe it now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you too. So, this obviously had what? What are we? June, July? Because you you mentioned going into the next. Yeah, yeah. So we had got out at the end of May, I would say. So this would be the beginning of June, mid June. Okay. So right. So it's dark out. You guys are in this. You said outcropping. Um, how did you guys? It's kind of like almost like a, a almost like a, a a patio almost, but it, it used to be. You know, there used to be stairs that walked up from the outside, and I'm sure there was, like, concrete underneath it as well. It had fallen away, right. and the stairs had fallen away. So it was just this just this messy outcropping of, of concrete that we were standing on that we went outside to see what these wild dogs were barking about, and that's where it happened. So how was there – how were you able to see anything with it being so dark? Uh, it was just um, – Besides the light coming from inside, so when I told you how high this pile was, probably 15, 20 feet off the ground, only two rows of these metal whatevers, they all find out what they are someday. Um, that's like a goal of mine to know what they were. <laughs> they were probably, I'd say, three and a half feet high. So we had two rows of them, so about six, seven feet high. So the fire was throwing massive amount of light. Oh, you know, there was probably above those two rows, there was probably another good eight feet of just open air on this huge wall. So the light from the fire was going out. And when anything was at the top, be it a dog or anything at the top of this pile, you're getting light from the fire. So it so was really it light. Well. Yeah, yeah, we did. And yeah. it was only 15 to 25 feet at the most from us. So that's too cool. It was, it was a clear night and, and the fire was throwing some good light on there and it just happened to be right at the right spot and we were getting a decent view of it. And then when, of course, when it came in, then we saw everything, you know, it was like, holy f are you kidding me? So and that's once it was on the pile, I saw you guys looked at each one of you. I, I'm I'm trying to remember. How did you say it went from the top of the pile to going in, or did it just vanish, or did you guys run away? I'm trying to remember. No, we. It took two steps from us after it stood up and it it threw that infrasound at us, and um, after it took the second step, my one buddy that was behind me to my left oh, who had lost right. his shit, he that's ran right. in first, and we all kind of looked and saw him, and we all followed suit. That's and right. it was a sloppy run because, you know, like I had told you, I felt like my legs were in quicksand. They felt like they didn't want to work. So it was sloppy, you know, running in, hitting the wall, running up the stairs, almost falling on ourselves. And, you know, we got up to that third floor, and it, and it wasn't a fast run up. It, it took, you know, a little bit of time to get up there. And then it came in. I think it watched us from outside. Wow. Because standing on the top of that, you could have seen straight in above that makeshift wall and you could see those stairs. So I'm sure it watched us run up the stairs and then it started coming in. And then we had got to the third floor. I think we were out of sight. It came in, it was sniffing around and it finally just caught a scent. Because, uh, you know, wind was whipping in that building every which way. And I just think finally from the fire, and it, it just finally caught us. And it snapped its head up, and it looked right at us. It, it didn't and have it any just, to the fire? Not really. No. It, it kept its distance. I would say it probably came within three feet at the most from the fire. It well, was well, close guess, to it, but it didn't. I guess what I'm asking it. is when it appeared over the i guess we'll call it the coke right and it was it was watching where the dogs were just had i'm assuming thrown the dogs and they ran away mm -hmm. it wasn't like hey why is there a fire burning 
No, no, it wasn't paying any attention to us at all. It was watching them. It was very, it was zoned in on those dogs because they attacked it. And I think it, it protected itself and, and it took care of business. And then it was basically letting them know it was marking its territory. And, and then it heard, the, it heard the sound and it looked at us and it did. It initially for a split second was like, whoa. And then it was on. That's so animal-like to do that too. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was shock then anger. One of the things that comes to my mind is the Hexum head case. And I don't know how familiar you are with that. Um, uh -huh. Long story short, back in the 1970s, a family, I don't remember the names, they found these two small, I don't know what they were made of, the, these actual like, carved out heads. One was what they would call the hag, which kind of resembled a witch's face. The other one would resemble the boy. I mean, they're, they're crudely carved stone. So uh, <laughs> those terms should be, should be used ambiguously. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, long story short, the, the effects from those stones, apparently multiple people had encountered this like shadowy werewolf thing coming in their house. And it just, as soon as you mentioned turning to that form, I'm like, there's more than one story of like people talking about the, the, this, werewolf apparition and, mm -hmm. and, and i want to take this and, and and ask you at the time that this happened what well, we're talking like 1988 89 right 87 i would say yeah, 87 okay mm -hmm. at that point we all know movies man you're you're at the pinnacle of, of the golden era of werewolf movies you had mm -hmm. american werewolf in london what not even 10 15 years the prior. howling yeah the how ha ha silver bullet yeah. i mean great I, movie it, what, 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 great movies so when it came to that point you saw that did you ever have anything like oh my gosh like we we saw a werewolf like what else would we say yeah no it was right away in my mind it was holy shit it's a werewolf yeah it wasn't what is it it's first it was on all fours and it was what the hell is that and then it stood up and it was just bing 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 it's a werewolf that it's what's not supposed to be real it's real yeah 100 percent. that's what i thought it, i knew what it was and that's what i called it for years was a werewolf i you know dog man is a newer term yeah and i 100 percent don't believe these that there's people it's possible. I think anything's possible, Josh. I, I, I think these things are, are what they are all the time. I don't think yeah. they turn into men. Yeah, I, I don't get any sense of that. So, okay. So, I, I, I will say this. I, I slightly disagree. And here, let, let me make the distinction. Not, okay. So, and from what, what I've seen and what I've studied, you have what, what you, what, basically what you saw, right? We're talking about a... A, uh, I guess you. I, I guess I'm just going to call it a demonic entity of some because that that's what I firmly believe they are and where, where they're rooted from. And so I these agree. things is just like what you saw, right? They, they can come in and out of our density. Uh, they could take whatever form they want, and it seems that when they manifest in our in our plane of existence, uh, they take on those attributes, right? They could. This kind of goes back and forth because there's some stories that support it. And there's some stories that go against it. But if they get shot, they bleed. I've heard other stories where bullets don't even affect them or go through them. Mm -hmm. um, so I almost wonder if there's some sort of like law that they have to abide by. A law we wouldn't understand that where if like they're in this realm long enough, they become they they acquire more of those physical attributes. They have to eat. They have to sleep. Right? They're in a they're in a physical body. But at the same time, it seems. Now, now, cloaking is separate, but it seems that they can, like, travel back and forth the same mm -hmm. way that people talk about Bigfoot's doing, where they can right. go through um, – it makes me – I don't know if you ever play video games, but it brings me back to the game Portal, where you can kind of, like, yeah. hop back and – yeah, yeah, that's, that's what makes me think, at their own whim. And then well, you hear about, about Skinwalker Ranch. I hate to interrupt you. You hear no, about no, go ahead. Know, no, no, no. They've yeah, seen yeah. they've seen dog men coming out of uh, – and other beings coming out of portals at Skinwalker Ranch as well. Um, I also heard a story, um, I forget whose it was, um, I'll remember it and, and tell you whose it was, but I heard it was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Dixie Cryptid or somebody else, about a girl that had an experience at summer camp, um, it was near Bray Road in Michigan, uh, she saw a dog man and then one night she went into the area that she had seen it. And she said when she went to the area, she saw a, um, a, a ball of light 
that was, you know, roughly the size of a basketball that was shining real bright in the exact same spot. And she started to follow it. It was going away. She stepped on a branch and it stopped and turned around and looked at her. Now, is that its normal shape? Is that its normal being? And that it just takes form of something to scare the shit out of anybody that sees it? I don't know, but it definitely makes me think that they can change form. So, yeah, again, so I, I feel like that we would be talking about the, the supernatural entity kind. I mm-hmm. guess I wouldn't call it the kind. It is, it, it is what it is. And then the other thing I was going to say was it seems, and I've heard other stories about, like, other stories similar to this is where there's certain people, black magic practitioners that are able to completely give themselves, like, sell their soul and everything in, in exchange for spiritual power. Like skinwalkers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that, that they can shapeshift to a whim. There is a story. Yeah, the, like, skinwalkers is a great example. I believe uh, in, in a skinwalker. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's, there was a story, and... I don't want to say that it was someone who 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 had who had literally shape shifted, but it does. It, it definitely sounds similar to yours. That this is probably the first instance of a dogman I ever heard. This is so. My mom. I'm gonna backtrack here. My mom is really into paranormal witness and like you know, uh, uh, what what do you call it? it was Alone in the Woods? Whatever the show was. I know the show. Well, haunted. Um, uh, um, haunted. Haunt, yeah, these haunted woods. Yeah. These woods are haunted. Uh, yeah. These haunted woods. Yeah. She, she, big, big into Bigfoot. She was the reason why that she, you know, she kind of started the the cryptid bug. Anyway, okay, um, yeah, it was all because of her. Although I kind of found out about Dogman and all the other stuff, but yeah, she was always like, "Oh, have you heard this encounter? Oh, have you heard this?" And so I remember being a teenager, and she told me about this one story in particular of this woman. I don't know. It sounded like she was on the East Coast somewhere. I want to say it was like Maine, where it's like wooded. You know, we're talking like closer to Pennsylvania, up in that area, where it's just like mm-hmm. you're in it. And she was driving in the evening time, and she said her car suddenly died. Like, all the power just shut off. And she said within within a few seconds, this is my mom reiterating the story, that the lady saw the, this, what she would describe as this werewolf being come out onto the road, look at her through the car. And my mom told me that that the lady explained the same thing, that this thing spoke telepathically to her. And it said, I told her, I'm going to come rip your throat out. Oh, and no. she starts bawling. She's crying. She's praying to God Almighty. And it walks up to her car door. And as it begins to reach for her car handle, it stops. And it says something else to her telepathically like, oh, I didn't know you were the one or you were protect Something along those lines like, oh, I didn't know you you were a believer or, or something. I can't remember. As long as lines oh, man, that's her alone. Well, well she was shit. she was a Christian and she, she was praying, she was using Jesus' name. She was praying and praying and praying. And so I know a lot of people could just take them like, yeah, you know, well, but I'm like, listen, I hear that, but at the same time, it's just another domino in the pile of dominoes, man. Mm-hmm. Like it's like, oh my gosh. How many do you gotta hear? You know, you know, it, it just makes you think about what you had said. You know, if, if if it is a demonic entity, and then it realizes that you are a quote unquote believer in God or something, that there are some kind of rules that it's not allowed to touch pe- people that believe in God or or that start spouting prayer or something like that, and then maybe it is demonic. This interview is hard because. <laughs> We're so limited on time, and I got to wrap it up because That's there's okay. so many ways we can go with it. You know, I'm yeah. just like, oh man. But we got to wrap it up. Is there any last things you'd like to go ahead and say and just address? You know, I, I just, you know, would like to just say to everybody out there again anybody that knows me knows that I am not someone who is, is you know, a, a, a fanciful person of making things up, uh, crazy stories that has mental issues, that lies as a pathological liar. People in my community know the type of person that I am, the, the thing that I do for a living and, and the respect that I have for my community. Um, I have no reason to lie or to say this because it would be 
hurtful to me if I was to lie about something like this. So these things exist. This really happened to me. I want to say how much I appreciate people like you, Josh, and Josh Turner, and, and Martin Groves, and, and Ron Moorhead, and Barton Nunley, and Daryl Denton, and the whole crew, um, Bettina Moss, and all of them who have the guts to come and, and, and address these situations and, and talk about it intelligently and, and not you know, make fun of this situation. It, it's serious. And those that have had these these things happen to them for real know that it's not, you know, this isn't funny and this isn't entertainment, even though watching these videos is entertaining and I get entertainment from hearing other people's experiences. What happened to me and my friends was real and it, it caused real damage to all four of us. And me and then my other buddy who's still here, we're still dealing with it. So um, I appreciate you letting me tell this and, and, it, and it's been a pleasure you know being on and it's a pleasure getting to know you and be friends with you likewise and thank you i'm trying to think of any of the last things i could possibly stick in um <laughs> i guess with that said folks you just got to be careful when going into the woods absolutely <laughs> so what did you guys think if you guys made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below, Matt's encounter is real, so I know who made it to the end. And if you guys enjoyed this episode and want to see more accounts just like it, go ahead and smack that big old red like and subscribe button for more. And if you have an experience or encounter that you'd like to share with me personally, please reach out to me on Facebook or the email down below. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the very next episode.